Hi, and welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. Today we are looking at NOAA 15 for possibly the last time. Now I just did a video about NOAA 15 and 19 being shut down. These are the last of the United States polar orbiting weather satellites that still use VHF radio transmissions and L-band microwave radio transmissions. These are slightly older satellites and they've both outlived their design life and they're scheduled to be shut down this week. Now in the prior video I said that NOAA 15 would be shut down first on August 12th and NOAA 19 would be shut down on August 19th. Now since I put that video out things have changed a little bit. NOAA 19 apparently had a battery failure so it is actually dead. As far as I can tell NOAA 19 is just gone. But NOAA 15 has been given a few extra days before that gets shut down. So we're going to try to receive that one again. Just like the last video, I'm going to try to receive all three of the radio bands that it transmits in. I have two different laptops here set up to two hacked TV satellite dishes on the roof for both L-band and S-band. So 1.7 gigahertz and 2.2 gigahertz. I'm going to track the passing low Earth orbit satellite with both those dishes, record the signal, hopefully get some kind of an image out of it, although L-band on NOAA 15 has always been kind of a weak transmitter, so we might not get much out of it. I also have a VHF automated receiver system up on the roof, and we'll be recording the VHF transmission from that, so hopefully we can compare all three signals. This is something I've wanted to do for a while. I tried it in the last video. I had some issues with the S-band setup, but um, we're going to give it another shot. And that satellite starts coming over in about... 48 seconds here, so we should be all ready to go. So I'm watching these dishes from the ground, and I notice the new one, the WineGuard Traveler Pro on the right, is a little bit slower to respond than the older WineGuard Traveler. Now these do show up on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. I got uh, one of these for $50 and one of these for free. All right, we are recording both L-band on the right and S-band on the left for one of the last passes of NOAA 15. So there is our HRPT signal on S-band, and uh, here it is on L-band. Yeah, there's a big dip in the middle. Um, this hack RF has an issue. Uh, I actually got this one replaced. Uh, they sent me a replacement, and it's been working just great. Uh, I still occasionally use this one, although it's not really working that well. So I just have to record off to the side here on a wider bandwidth. Someday I should get a real ham shack. Maybe I can actually build a shack on the roof of the garage and I should just stop doing this wedge between the laser cutter and the drill press, but that's what I have for now. All right, both of those passes are done. I'm running the baseband recordings from SDR++ through SatDump, which is going to decode the basebands and hopefully give me some nice pictures. And I know that SatDump will do all of these steps. It will run the rotor, it will uh, record the baseband, it will live decode. Theoretically, I've never actually been able to get it to do that, and I don't know why. I've poked around with it a few times on a few different computers, and I've just never had any luck getting sat dump to do all the other features. So um, for now, I am just using my old school uh, project flow here where I record in STR++, I use gpredict to run the rotor, and then I use sat dump just for decoding the signal. I know that's maybe a little kludgier and a little slower, but it works for me and I just haven't had time to figure out all the other stuff with sat dump. Now, as expected, the S band on the left is decoding nicely. We have a good strong signal there. On the right, we're only getting a few frames of data so far because that is the L band signal and it was much weaker. I mentioned last time that we got the L band picture but not the S band because I screwed up some stuff on that laptop. This time we got S-band and it looks beautiful, but we didn't get any picture out of L-band. I could see the transmission on L-band, we recorded the baseband signal, but it just wasn't strong enough to get anything out of it. So um, that's kind of been hit or miss with NOAA 15, that's how it goes. So unfortunately I still do not have uh, successful downloads on all three uh, frequencies, but we've got two out of the three, so that's pretty good. The VHF APT signal is really decent. We have a good geographic coverage on that. I'm using this QFH egg beater type antenna up on the roof, and that gets a nice 
um, wide chunk of the satellite's pass overhead. So we can see all the way from up in Canada to down into Mexico. The S-band signal doesn't usually get quite as much geographic coverage because it needs a stronger signal. It needs the satellite to be kind of directly overhead to get much out of that. If I had a little bit bigger dish for S-band, I might be able to get more geographic coverage. But again, this is pretty good. It gives me the central US, it gives me the Midwest, and it shows me basically what's right overhead and what's in my region as far as weather, which is mainly what I want to see from uh, these weather satellites. In the Midwest here, most of the weather patterns move west to east anyway, so it doesn't really matter for us what's going on down in Texas, except when Texas loses its power grid because they have a little snow and then Minnesota ends up paying their heating bills for five years. Now that was the main thing I wanted to do today, but it doesn't make for much of a video, so maybe I'll discuss the dish system that I'm using in a little more detail, because a couple people asked about that in the comments on the last video. So the basic setup to control one of those RV satellite dishes like the WineGuard Traveler or like the older dome models like the Carryout is the laptop running my custom Python code which talks to the dish brain over a serial connection. In this case I'm using a USB serial connection for the WineGuard Traveler Pro which uses a slightly newer box than the older Traveler. So this is the interface box for the dish, the indoor unit. Uh, this thing has uh, an Ethernet port, which I haven't used yet. It has the control wires out to the dish, power supply in, and a USB port. It actually has another USB port on the front. I haven't used that one. I don't know if it does the same as the one on the back, or if that one's just for flashing new firmware. On the radio end of things, I'm using a Nualec Hack RF1, and that is hooked up to a custom feed on the front of the dish. And the feed is essentially a helical spiral of wire hooked up to an antenna jack. This is an old junky one that I had lying around in my junk box. This is for a circularly polarized signal. So the signal is being transmitted with something that looks like this on the satellite, which means that the radio waves come out in kind of a spiral, and you need a spiral antenna to pick it up. And that's in contrast to what you normally get on the front of your TV satellite dish, which looks more like this or this. These are called LNBs, low noise block down converters. And inside here, there's often a spiral shaped thing as well, because some TV satellites use a circularly polarized signal. Some of them use a linearly polarized signal. It just depends where you are in the world and what satellite service you use. But basically, this is what collects all of the signals that are bounced off the reflector part of the dish aimed into one of these things at the focal point and then sent out to your actual radio receiver over an antenna cable. This is another one made with a 3D printed reflector uh, called a helicone. This is not my design, but I can link to uh, the design for this on Thingiverse if you have a 3D printer and you want to make one of these. It's pretty simple and you don't need this rotor uh, motor mechanism on the bottom. You can just hand hold this thing for L-band satellites. I've got another couple videos on building and using this guy. So again, up here we have one of those helical feeds on the S-band dish and on the L-band dish. It might be hard to tell, but these are slightly different sizes because they are different frequencies and the radio waves coming in are basically different sizes. So L-band is a lower frequency, so it uses a bigger feed. And S-band is a higher frequency, so it uses a little bit smaller feed. This is another 3D printed one that Derek SGC designed. And this one I made with a laser cutter, so you could even make this freehand with just some pieces of wood and some kind of waterproofing or clear coat, so you don't even need a 3D printer to make one of these, just some pieces of wood and a scrap of wire. I also have these amplifiers on here. This one is a filter amplifier for L-band. This one is the Nualex Sawbird Plus Goes. I recommend this one a lot. I use it a lot. I, I think I own about five or six of these for various dishes now. Yes, they are a little expensive. They cost about $40, $50 for the good one, and some people don't have that much money. If you're making your antennas out of wood and wire scraps, the little filter amplifier is a big investment. You can sometimes use cheaper wideband amplifiers. I've had mixed luck with those. Some people have said they're really good. It just depends on how much noise there is in your neighborhood. If you're in a busy city with a lot of other radio stuff going on like I am, then it's nice to have a high-quality LNA device here. Now on the S-band dish, I do have a wideband LNA, but I also have a uh, 2250 megahertz filter that I found on eBay. Unfortunately, Nualec does not make an S-band LNA, and I haven't found a good consumer level model, so I had to kind of piece this together out of um, scraps that I found on eBay. I think I actually have two amplifiers, one on each end and then the filter in the middle, 
And that's kind of what New Elect does with theirs. They just stack it all into a smaller package. I know I'm repeating myself with a lot of this info. I've covered all of this in many other videos, but I do rattle off a lot of terms, a lot of acronyms, and people do ask in the comments, what's an LNA? Do I need the Nualec LNA? Can I get away with a cheaper LNA? Can I do it this way? Can I do that? Can you explain X, Y, Z? So I am trying to explain as I go and not be too technical because I am always learning this stuff as I go. and. I really found it helpful for uh, watching videos that had step-by-step -step guides that really broke down a lot of the pieces of what people were doing when listening to satellites. And that's something that really helped me learn. So if I can do the same for other people, I'll try to do that. For those of you who already know all this stuff, I'm sorry for repeating myself so often. Speaking of repeating myself, I've shown this stripey boy in like every video lately. This is Oliver. He's the neighbor's cat. He's been getting more friendly with me, although he's still not as friendly as my own stripey cat. Hi, yeah, you just you just like to saunter into the garage, go around mouse patrol. Yes, there are a lot of mice in the garage here, so I'm okay with him coming in and clearing them out as long as he doesn't pee in a corner somewhere. This guy does have a home. We don't need to keep him. We don't need more stripey cats. And he already fights with our cats through the window enough times, so. All right, I forgot what I was doing before there was a cat distraction. I am trying to update my code that runs that Traveler Pro. I mentioned earlier that it's a little bit different from the older WineGuard Traveler. This indoor unit box needs another step to get your serial console from the indoor box tunneled out to the outdoor unit, to the actual dish. That's where all the motors live. That's where the motor control system lives. So the indoor box here just has like Wi-Fi and other boring stuff. The outdoor unit is what I actually want to talk to with the computer. And I'm having trouble tunneling through it. There's a command, uh, you just type in ODU to get from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit. As I said, I'm connecting this with a double-ended USB cable. It's just USB-A on each end going from the laptop to the port on the back here. And then I'm running a screen command on a serial port in Linux. I think you could do that in Windows too. You could do it with CoolTerm or PuTTY or some other Windows terminal. Um, as long as you know what port it is. I think on Windows it would be like COM3 or COM5. On Linux, it's TTY ACM0. On this laptop, I think on the other laptop, it's TTY USB0 because the reasons. I also had a weird issue where I pulled this laptop out today. I had used it a week ago for NOAA 15 and NOAA 19. I had used some of the exact same code, the same Python code using the same includes. I didn't even turn it off. I just shut the lid, put it in my office charging, brought it out here, opened the lid, ran my Python code again, and suddenly the includes weren't there. It was saying, oh, there's no regex package. What? There was last week. Where did it go? <laughs> so again, I have no idea why Linux does these things. It just does. Oliver, you're just going to explore the workbench now? Hi. When in doubt with Python and Serial, just make everything slower. I had to put a bunch of these time.sleep one second commands in, so I have to uh, basically let this think for a minute, let that magic box think when it's tunneling from the ODU to the IDU. If I start sending commands too quickly, it kicks me back into the IDU. So yeah, I basically just have to slow down my program to make it work. Now, if you have one of these WineGuard Traveler dishes, you'll have to hack a couple other things in the firmware. For example, uh, to make it go to 90 degrees vertical elevation like this, you have to go into the NVS submenu uh, from the outdoor unit's brain and change the minimum and maximum elevation values. I had to change them to 0 and 90 for to get full range. And now that I say that, I'm realizing it won't actually go past 75 degrees. So um, it looks like 75 is actually the physical maximum elevation that this dish will do. So this one, the older Traveler, uh, this is the LG2112. This will elevate to a full 90 degrees. So this will look at a satellite directly overhead. The Pro here only goes to 75 degrees. It looks like there's some physical ability for that arm to move back more. It just refuses to do so. Unfortunately, that makes this turret much less useful. And um, I'm going to have to say that makes the WineGuard Traveler Pro a much less desirable outdoor unit um, than the older model. Now the indoor unit from the Pro is nice because it has that USB interface. So could we use the Pro's indoor unit in place of the older indoor unit? Um, maybe, but unfortunately on this one, uh, I have kind of permanently installed the control wires because 
The clip on the back here was broken off, so those are basically glued into place, and I'm not going to pull that out to see if it's compatible with the other one. It does seem to be the same pin out. It's green, yellow, orange, and then uh, red, brown, black on the bottom of the plug. And so far the firmware on the outdoor units of both turrets has looked the same, so it's possible you can mix and match turrets and indoor units. I guess one other thing I can try is can I control it with this front USB port? Uh, not really necessary, but might be nice to know. And that looks like a no. This front USB port is not a full port. It's probably just for flashing firmware from a thumb drive. So if you want to control the thing, uh, this is the only working USB port for serial interface. Yeah, the motor is stalling out when I try to send the elevation past 75. All of these wine guards have multiple ways to control the motors, so if I try sending the motor directly to 90 degrees, and then uh, look at the motor status, yeah, that elevation is still at 75, so uh, no matter which command I use, it will not go past 75. So my recommendation, if you are doing this yourself, if you're trying to hack an old television satellite dish to track low Earth orbit satellites, um, stick with the older model WineGuard Traveler, if that's the one you're after. Don't get the Traveler Pro because it's a newer model, but it's a worse model. And unfortunately, that's kind of a trend with American products and American electronics, is companies will come up with a product that works great, that people love, and they'll make a newer version that's worse. So unfortunately, the newer version is worse, at least for my purposes. It's slower, it's more limited. Now, if anyone from WineGuard is watching, I don't have anything against the company. I like their products. I own a ton of their little dome satellite dishes. I've hacked a bunch of those. I just picked up another one at an estate sale. I haven't even gotten into this one yet to see how it works, but I'm looking forward to playing around with this other WineGuard product. And I even have one of their big 10 foot diameter C-band dishes made by the same company. So if anyone from WineGuard does see this and wants to send me products to review, well, my contact info is on the main channel page. Although if your legal team wants to yell at me, then that, that's not my real contact info. Ignore all that. That's about all I've got for this video. I'm pretty much going to give up on the WineGuard Traveler Pro because it is not as useful as I hoped for my purposes. I'll keep it around. Maybe I'll come up with something else to do with it. Maybe I can modify it in another way so that it maybe I can just put it on a tilt so that it goes below zero and above 75 but that'll be projects for another day and I have a bunch of motorized dishes that I need to play with as well so um, we may or may not come back to that thing in the meantime I will be using the other WineGuard Traveler because that one has been super flexible super useful so for L-band tracking we might have to stick with the WineGuard Carryout and the 3D printed Helicone although that's a little bit smaller doesn't get quite as good of a signal as the larger reflector that I had on the Traveler but it does work a little better and the range of elevation is better Thank you to all my Patreon supporters for helping me buy weird satellite dishes on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. I'll put a list of some of the $10 and $20 Patreon members over here. These folks really do help me grow the channel. They help me buy weird, obscure surplus satellite dishes and hack into them, and I think that's pretty fun. Hopefully everyone enjoyed this video, and if you have not yet gone out and listened to NOAA 15, I think you still have a couple days to do so. So run out there, try to download some NOAA 15 weather data, either on a VHF or if you have an L-band satellite dish or an S-band satellite dish, go ahead and try that. And again, I have demonstration videos on all that stuff that's probably a little better and more of a step-by-step -step, uh, how-to guide than this particular video. Finally, thank you to everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time.